Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a privilege to worship with you again, whether you're joining us by video, by phone, or in person. You are loved and appreciated wherever you are. And if you're continuing to self-quarantine, which I know some of you are, uh, please let me know if there's anything that we can do to help you out or support you during these times. And so even if it's just something simple or small, like running an errand for you, um, you're not forgotten during this time. Last week I shared Psalm 139 with you and was talking about the presence of God as we started our time of worship together. Today, I want to begin with reading a portion of Psalm 119. So perhaps you have a Bible or device and you want to pull it up, I'm going to be reading from a, probably a different translation than you have. But these words come from verses 33 through 40. So Psalm 119, 33 through 40. It says, God, teach me lessons for living so I can stay the course. Give me insight so I can do what you tell me my whole life, one long, obedient response. Guide me down the road of your commandments. I love traveling this freeway. Give me a bent for your words of wisdom and not for piling up loot. Divert my eyes from toys and trinkets and invigorate me on the pilgrim way. Affirm your promises to me, promise made to all who fear you. Deflect the harsh words of my critics but what you say is always so good. See how hungry I am for your counsel. Preserve my life through your righteous ways. The words I just read to you are the words of a person that understands that life with God is a one long journey. It's not a series of short sprints. Notice the words that they use. Stay the course. One long obedient response. The road of your commandments, a freeway, the pilgrim way. 
These are words and phrases that refer to a journey. And so what this worshiper recognizes so they, is that they are in desperate need of God's guidance and word. Without God's guidance, without God's word, they won't be able to stay the course. They won't be able to keep moving in the right direction. And so as we gather for worship this morning, it is vital that we too recognize that we are on a long journey together. We don't travel alone, but we travel together. We may be at different points on the road. Some of us have been on the road for a long time. Some of us are just taking our first steps. But regardless, our need for God's guidance guidance and word is the same. We need to be reminded what it means to live the way of Jesus day by day. So as we pray together this morning, let's seek God's guidance and open our hearts to his word. Let's become good listeners who give the spirit space to speak in our lives. Let's set aside every distraction so that we can sense where God is leading and how God is challenging us along the journey. We continue to lift up the needs of our community and congregation, and there are several medical needs that people have in our congregation, whether it's tests or treatment, surgeries, illnesses. And so let's do a good job remembering these needs in prayer together this morning. We also pray for the seeds that God planted this week during the five-day club we hosted and praise God for the decisions that were made by the kids. And so we got to be a part of them making some key decisions and beginning their journey with God. We pray for our world and nation. We pray that God would continue to guide our leaders and work through the church to cast love and grace and peace into our world. So with all that said, as we focus ourselves on God, would you join me in prayer? Father, we come in desperate need of your guidance and your word today, Lord. There's a lot of guidance we've received, a lot of words that we've heard in the past week, but nothing compares to your word. Nothing compares to your guidance. You've set us on this journey. There's not one of us that started this journey on our own without your help. It's because of your grace that we are walking the road with you together. And so help us today, Lord. Help bring us into a posture of worship where we are uh, listening well to your word, where we let you teach us and counsel us, redirect us, challenge us, whatever it is that you need to do in our hearts today, Lord, we give you permission to do it. We think of those, Lord, today that are struggling with various physical challenges, whether they're going in for tests, Lord, we pray that those tests would come back uh, in good order, that, that they would show positive signs. We pray for those that are considering surgeries and treatments. Pray that you would give all the doctors guidance, that you would place your healing hand, that you would work through all of the interventions that they're considering. We pray for those that are looking at surgery, Lord, that you would help make the preparations, that you would guide the surgeons, that you would bring healing to those involved. Lord, we also pray for the kids and the families that participated in the five-day club. We thank you and praise you for what you did this past week. We thank you for CEF and their work with the kids and the lessons that were taught. And we just pray that those things would take root in the kids' lives, that we would be faithful, that we would continue to walk alongside them and guide them in the coming days. We also pray, Lord, that you would continue to bring kids into our church so that they can hear the good news of the gospel. We pray for our world and our nation, Lord, a world that's hurting and broken, divided, we pray, Lord, that you would give leaders, leaders in our world and our nation guidance, but we also pray that you would help us play the role that we're supposed to play in our community and in our world, that you would help us become, become conduits of your love and your grace and your mercy and your peace in these days. Help us, Lord, as we transition here and we continue to give, we continue to hear and listen to your word. Help us to be united by your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. Um, we haven't had a, a traditional offering in a long time, and I know some of you are probably getting tired of mailing in your checks and, and doing all of that, but we really appreciate um, what you are giving your generosity in these times. I know that everyone's facing different financial realities, uh, different job situations, uh, and so I really, really appreciate your sacrificial giving and your faith in these days. Like I mentioned before, we had a great five-day club with kids this past week. We were able to connect with a few kids in the neighborhood. 
um, some faces that we haven't seen around. We praise God that a handful of kids accepted Christ this week and are beginning their own journeys. And I just want to thank you for your prayers, and I especially want to thank those that helped out this week. And whether they did something big or small, it was all part of a combined effort to reach out to the kids in our church and community. As always, you're invited to join us this coming Wednesday night for Zoom Discipleship at 6.30 p.m. You can join by video by going to tomochannity.org, or you can contact the church office, talk to Gina or myself, and we can give you details to join by the phone. You can call in and hear, listen, and also respond to the questions that I pose on that night. So we'd love to have you join us. So let's transition to our message for today. I want to remind you about where Jacob has been. Last week we were talking about Jacob, and he's been making the long journey from home. He's running for his life from his brother Esau, and he's going to a distant land where he hopes to find his uncle Laban. But along the way, Jacob encountered God in a dream, and despite Jacob's self-caused troubles and mistakes and flaws that are well documented, well documented in Genesis, God makes promises. God promises to give him a family that will grow and become a source of life for everyone they encounter. God will bless Jacob's family with gifts of grace and love, mercy and justice and peace. And they will bless others in return. And so we talked about sowing seeds in the soil for our lives. This is God's plan to redeem a world that is broken, hurting, and destructively self-centered. And God's plan always finds a way. Finally, after walking miles and miles through the wilderness across all sorts of landscapes, Jacob is connected with Laban and begins the hard work of building a new life in a new place. And so I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, moving from one place to another. Completely new territory for Jacob. We're left to wonder whether Jacob has put his selfishness, deception, lying, and cheating ways behind him. Is he going to treat people better this time? Will he lean into the promises of God that he received in the wilderness? Will he embrace the role he has been called to play in the family of God? Will he lean into this? So our passage for this morning comes from Genesis 29, 15 through 35. So if you have a Bible or a device nearby, I invite you to turn with me there as we read the next chapter in the story of the family of God together. Genesis 29, starting in verse 15, going to verse 35. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It's better that I give her to you then to some other man, stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as her attendant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, Isn't our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one? Finish this daughter's bridal week, and then we will give you the younger one also, in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. For she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. 
Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah, and then she stopped having children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before we delve too deep into the story, and before I start tracing what happens in the story that you just heard, we have to address the incredible distance that exists between the world of Jacob and his uncle Laban in our world today. As we were reading, you probably put a few things together if you were listening closely, if you were trying to track exactly what's going on here. Perhaps you noticed that Laban is Jacob's uncle, which makes Rachel and Leah Jacob's cousins. So you might be asking, and you're right with me, why then is Jacob allowed to marry them? That raises another question. Why is Jacob marrying not just one woman, but two women? How is it that this central figure in the family of God is allowed to have multiple wives? Isn't that forbidden by God? Finally, maybe you're just uncomfortable with the idea that Jacob's payment for his years of work isn't money or cattle or property. Instead, he's paid with two marriages with no indication that either Rachel or Leah had any input in this arrangement. They don't seem to have a voice in this deal that Laban and Jacob are making. So as we step back from this world, this strange world, we recognize that it's a world in which family members are being married, men have multiple wives, women are exchanged and married away to build alliances between men and tribes. And it goes without saying that this is not the world that we live in. Genesis 29 reveals how families and relationships operated then culturally. But it does not inform how families and relationships should operate now. And so as the biblical story progresses, we see the destructiveness of these arrangements. This doesn't work. Arranging families and societies and relationships in this way doesn't work, and we recognize God's commands against the very practices we find here throughout Scripture. The world of Jacob and Laban is a world of twisted relationships, a world in which women and servants are treated like property to be traded, and marriages are motivated by politics and payment rather than love. Yet, behind the scenes, maybe so far behind the scenes that we can't quite see it, God's plan to redeem a world that is broken, hurting, and destructively self-centered remains. And God's plan always finds a way. So Laban determines that he needs to offer Jacob something in exchange for his work. And Jacob knows exactly what he wants. He is in love with Laban's younger daughter, Rachel. Laban agrees to give Jacob his daughter in return for seven years hard work. But this doesn't deter Jacob. His love for Rachel is so strong that he agrees and he puts in the time required working in Laban's field and, and gathering Laban's flock and cattle. So at the end of the last day of his seven years of work, Jacob comes looking for his soon-to-be wife. He's excited. A great feast is held. And that's when everything goes sideways for him. You might have heard the saying, what goes around comes around. And in many cases, this saying doesn't hold any water. We know that some events happen in life without explanation or cause. We can't always say that one thing is the cause of another. But in Jacob's case, what goes around comes around fits perfectly. Remember, this is the same Jacob who exploited his brother for the privileges of the firstborn son and who fooled his blind father into mistakenly giving him the family blessing over his brother Esau. So Jacob meets his match in Laban. It seems like they're cut from the same cloth. Maybe they share the same genes as family members. What goes around comes around. Like Jacob's world back home that he left, Laban's world has been built upon dominating those around them, deceiving them, manipulating them for personal gain. He's been playing the very same game that Jacob was playing before he traveled across all those miles. 
Laban orchestrates everything, and he deceives Jacob into marriage, not with Rachel, but with her older sister, Leah. So when Jacob discovers this deception, he confronts Laban. And Laban reveals that despite their arrangement and his words to Jacob before, seven years ago, he never planned to give his younger daughter in marriage to him. But Jacob can have Rachel too, if he works for seven more years for Laban. Jacob has been outsmarted, he's been cheated, but he agrees to this new deal because he really wants to marry Rachel. That is the daughter that he loves. And so we find that the world of Jacob and Laban is defined by and filled with deception and cheating, lying and stealing, manipulation. It's a world of deal-making and decision-making that's built on human wisdom and cleverness. And we find that Jacob has been dealt the same hand he has previously dealt to others. And so as we look at all this and this mess that this is, we consider that behind the scenes, God's plan to redeem a world that was broken, hurting, and destructively self-centered remains. And God's plan always finds a way. This story is told from the perspective of Laban and Jacob, the men in the story. Their deal-making has given Jacob two wives, but we find out that the, his love for them is not equal. You see, Jacob's marriage to Leah, the older sister, was the result of trickery. His marriage to Rachel was motivated by his love for her, a love that drove him to work for 14 years. So Leah finds her place in the story as an unloved wife. She's the victim of a deceptive arranged marriage that she likely had no say in. She's placed in competition with her younger sister, who's clearly favored by Jacob. Jacob may have deserved what he received. We might see that perhaps all the things that he did before this story come back to him. But Leah didn't deserve any of this. She's a victim of the choices of other people. In our passage, Leah has four sons, and each is named in a way that expresses her desire for her husband's love. Jacob's detached. He's preoccupied with Rachel, and he doesn't see or hear the pain that Leah feels. All Leah wants is to be loved, but no one she turns to is able to fulfill that desire. Her father gave her away in a trick. Her husband never wanted to marry her in the first place, and her sister is jealous of her ability to have children. But what Leah doesn't realize or recognize is that behind the scenes, God's plan to redeem a world that is broken, hurting, and destructively self-centered remains, and she is a part of it. I spoke earlier about the distance, this broad distance that exists between the world of Jacob and Laban in our own world today. It might be difficult for us to recognize how these experiences of these individuals long ago have anything to offer us today. What is Jacob's decision to marry his cousins and not just one but two cousins and, and Leah's situation have to say to us? Applying this word to our lives requires bridging the distance between their world and ours. And so we've identified the things that separate us, all these marriage and family practices that are unfamiliar to us. And now it's time to identify the key thing that connects us. The connection we can draw is more of a question. Where is God in all of this mess? If you go back and you look into this, God never speaks in this story that I read you. We're given an account of a dishonest deal that's made between Jacob and Laban, but God is not mentioned in their deal-making. We're never told if Jacob, who encountered God in the wilderness and received all these promises, ever seeks God out in the 14 years that he works for Laban. Laban cheats Jacob, and God does not intervene. Jacob decides to take Rachel as his wife after marrying Leah, and God doesn't say a word. God blesses Leah with children because he sees that she's unloved, but God never speaks to Jacob about his lack of love and care for Leah or his favoritism toward Rachel. We're given a picture of a world that's run by human beings, and what a mess it is. There's Laban's deception and dishonesty that leads to questionable marriage practices. 
There's Jacob's failure as a husband. Leah's unmet desire for love and attachment. We're left to wonder if this is the story of the family of God, why does it seem like God isn't very involved? And so as we bridge the distance between their world and ours, the question of where is God in all this mess still stands. We look at a world run by human beings, a world that humans have created, and it's filled with violence and hatred, loneliness, depression, illness, greed, poverty, injustice, unfairness, abuse, and broken relationships. Tragedies occur that we are unable to make sense of. Wrongs are committed against others and never made right. We are cheated and treated unfairly. What a mess self-centered human beings have created. And what's worse, this mess has even found its way into the church. And perhaps you can think of a time maybe you've been hurt by the church before. It distracts and causes division and creates even more brokenness. And so a place where healing is meant to take place becomes a place where deep hurts are sometimes caused. So the question stands, where is God in all of this mess? Where is God in the terrifying diagnoses, the tragedies, the deaths, the violence, the hatred? Why does God not speak out from heaven when wrongs and injustices are committed? Why does God not take away the loneliness, depression, and anxiety? Where is God when we are cheated and treated unfairly? Does God not see our struggles? If we are a part of the family of God, the church, God's people today, why does it seem like God isn't very involved? And so we struggle with the perceived absence of God, and I, I just trust that that's somewhere where you've lived and been before along the journey of your walk with God. Not quite able to, to see where God is at work, not quite able to hear God's voice when it feels like you need to hear it most. Yet, behind the scenes, God's plan to redeem a world that is broken, hurting, and destructively self-centered remains, and God's plan always finds a way. Despite the destructive actions of self-centered human beings in this story, God's purposes are not thwarted. None of these curveballs that humanity throws God throws him off his, his plan. God makes a way. And so when it seems like God is absent, we find out that God is not. We worship Jesus who stepped down into the mess of humanity, who lived in it, died in it, and rose again claiming victory over the mess. We worship Jesus who's capable of giving you and I hearts of love rather than hearts of self-centeredness. We worship Jesus who ascended to heaven but promised he would one day return as the victorious king and set all things wrong, right. We worship the God who sees and hears the hurting, the God who freed slaves and defeated armies. We worship the God of Jacob who made promises founded upon his grace. I am with you. I will watch over you. I will bring you back home. We can imagine Jacob protesting to God when he discovers he's been cheated, when he's gotten the raw end of a deal for the first time in his life. Where were you, God? Why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you warn me and tell me and keep me from doing this? But Jacob had relied on his own wisdom, and he never consulted God. He had dismissed God from the plans he was making for himself. He saw what he wanted, and he went for it. Jacob made a mistake. He was a fool. Yet through it all, God worked to give Jacob twelve sons who would become the heads of the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob would go on to become more prosperous than he could have ever imagined. His family grew into the people of God, a people created to participate in God's plan to redeem, restore, and heal the world around them. Leah was the victim of an arranged deceptive marriage to an unloving husband who favored her sister over her. It's a disaster of a life. We catch a glimpse of her protest to God in the name of her first son, Reuben, whose name partly means misery. It's not a very happy name. And when naming her second son, Simeon, she points to the reality that no one, not even her own husband and sister, love her. 
Her third son, Levi, is named out of her desire that Jacob will finally, maybe finally, after all this time, become attached to her. Leah is the victim of a life created by her or for her by others. Yet God sees her. And God gives her the ability to conceive and to bear six sons, two of which will become the heads of the tribes of Levi and Judah. The Levites, these people that come from Levi, will go on to become the spiritual leaders, the priests and the family of God. They would help the people with worship. The descendants of Judah will go on to become kings who will rule over the people of God, the family of God. And eventually a baby named Jesus will be born from that tribe. It will be the king of all kings. So unloved Leah, you can imagine her sitting and trying to make sense of all the tragedy of her own life, the fact that she's unloved, that her deepest needs have not been met. She's not the main character in the story of the family of God, but the story can't be told without her. God makes a way for the family of God despite all the mess of their world, the mess that they participate in. And he does it through Leah, unloved Leah. She is blessed and loved by God. So the chapter of this story, and we're getting ready to wrap up, and so I hope that you're hearing something you can grab onto. The chapter of the story of the family of God we read today is what I would call a not yet story. We find individuals caught between what God has promised and the realities that they're facing. But if we turn the page, and we turn the page again and again and again all the way to the end of Scripture, we recognize that God's fingerprints are all over their lives. God was faithful. God was present every step of the way. God's plan to redeem a world that was hurting, broken, and destructively self-centered found a way amid it all. Where is God in all this mess? Right in the middle of it. I can't claim to know all the details of your life, but God does. I can't claim to know every single scenario and situation that makes you ask, where is God in all this mess? You might feel as if God is absent or not listening, distant from you. And the best news that I can give to you today is that perception does not always meet reality. When we talk about the absence of God, it's always a perceived absence because we know that we know that we know, and the story of Scripture tells us this, that God is present. When it seems that God isn't working, God is orchestrating things behind the scenes, just like God was working behind the scenes in the life of Jacob and Leah. When you are trapped in a not-yet story, caught in limbo between something that's been promised but not yet finished, you can trust that God's fingerprints will be all over your life. That you are part of the story that God is writing, that God is faithful, that God has a plan, and that God's plan always finds a way through the mess of our world and the messes of our lives. Like I say, I don't know where this lands for you today. I don't know whether... It's a matter of including God. Maybe perhaps you've been relying on your own wisdom and cleverness like Jacob, and, and you just need to turn your attention to give God a place in your story and the plans that you've been making. I don't know if you find yourself in the story of Leah, who's unloved, been treated unfairly, is the victim of all of this, and you just need to hear that God is present, that God is available to you, that God loves you and sees and hears you. And so as we pray today, I just pray that we would be given faith, an ability to, to believe in something that we can't see, that despite all the mess, the mess of our lives and the mess of our world, that God is faithful, that God has a plan, and that God is making all things right and is restoring and healing and renewing things, that God's fingerprints are all over our lives, and that God is right in the middle of the mess with us and will never leave us. So would you pray with me today as we respond to these words? Father, we thank you that as we come to Scripture and we see this different world that we don't quite understand, this world in which uh, things are taking place and marriages and family relationships are different than, the, than how they are today, 
that we can recognize that you worked through it all. You worked through the mess that these people created, Jacob and his own arrogance, trying to make his own plans, Leah, in a life that's been created for her by others, and she's a victim of it. We recognize that you are faithful, that you stuck by them, that you continued to work through them, and that the family of God continued in them. The people of God were brought through all of this so that they could bless the world, all the way to Jesus Christ, who stepped down into the mess to save us. Lord, give us faith in your presence in these days. Give us faith in the middle of the not yet, the things that we're waiting on, the things that we're struggling through, to believe that you are at work behind the scenes in ways that we can't begin to recognize and understand. That you are not absent from our stories, but you're in the middle of them. Encourage us today, Lord. Remind us of your presence in our lives. Remind us of whether we caused the mess or we were victims of the mess, that you're right alongside us, that you have a plan, and that your plan always finds a way. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for helping us and teaching us through your word. It's in the name of Jesus we pray all of this. Amen. Receive these words of benediction today as you go. Thank you for joining us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Go in peace. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.